so when I put together the program, I wanted to focus not only on the technology, but also on people. And if you remember in our past conferences, we've done a lot of work around the power of the crowd. And GigWalk is a business model that really harnesses the power of the crowd. And I asked David to come and talk about 30 minutes around what they're doing and how we should think about labor and the power of the crowd. David? This is the clicker. Thank you. Y yeah. Lovely. So I want to talk a little bit, not, not just about kind of crowdsourcing and harnessing the, the power of the crowd with mobile, but also just talk more generally about how work is changing uh, and how the, the trends in work and the trends in technology are, are something that you can use to really understand your supply chain better. So the nature of work is changing. Um, and this is something I think that John mentioned uh, and illustrated quite well. If you look kind of in the, in the 20th century, we had mass production of everything. So automobiles, you have the example of the Model T, um, but uh, steel, telecommunication, 40 years ago you had the same, you, there were two or three brands of phones that you could buy, uh, and they were pretty much all the same. Um, now you've got custom everything. Uh, everything from beer to steel to automobiles, uh, mobile phones. And it, the reason that we're doing that is because patterns of consumption are changing. So it used to be that you would buy you know, the same car, same phone, uh, but now again you buy everything. And by the way, you can buy it now. So um, Amazon has come out with a new service. They call it, I think it's Amazon Now. You can basically order something and have it delivered in New York within one hour. Okay. So just think about that. I was fixing my car the other week. I needed a specialized tool. I ordered it. I had it the following day. And all of that is driving pretty fundamental changes in work. So I don't know if this is changing all of your industries as much as it is changing mine, but in the Bay Area, uh, uh, you know, it used to be you'd work Monday to Friday, uh, 9 to 5. That was really because of the way we produced and the way we consumed. You could have that kind of a regular, predictable work week. And what's changing now is you have flex work. So, you know, our workers, they work pretty much continuously, okay? So you might have people, they wake up, they do a little bit of work at 7, they get into the office around 10, they work to 7 p.m., they go home, they have dinner, and they might work from 9 to 11, they go, go to home, they start over again. And that's kind of the way millennials are operating now. Um, the other kind of change in... Um, and the nature of work is uh, the rise of part-timers. So there's about six, time, six million part-timers. This is just in North America. Um, and if you look at kind of full-on contingent work in North America, it's uh, around about 50, 55 million people now. And it is, generally speaking, increasing. If you look at when they started measuring the work back in 1960 to now, it is increasing. It used to be that we were outsourcing just manufacturing. And I think that trend has happened. Then we have business process outsourcing. But now we're really kind of outsourcing the services sector as well. And that's leading to a change in the fundamental nature of what, what jobs are like. So I want to talk about five trends kind of shaping the, na uh, the future of work. So this is done by a group called Chess Media Group that uh, kind of coined the term future of work. And um, you've got new behaviors, technology, the millennial workforce, mobility, and then globalization. I want to talk a little bit about each, each one here. Um, so behaviors and technology. Um, people now, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about work-life balance, and I think the reality that, uh, that I see is it's pretty much commingled, okay? So we carry around these, uh, you know, fully networked mini computers in our pocket now, and you can work anywhere. Um, there is no, there's no separation unless you choose to turn it off. Um, guerrilla adoption, so um, how many of you have heard of a company called Slack? Okay, a few of you. It is the fastest growing software company ever, okay? Um, and uh, effectively, it, it is or will become the replacement for email, okay? So it's kind of a combination of chatter, email, connected, linked with, uh, with content. Um, and what happens is that uh, people will download this thing to their phone. They use it free. There are certain limitations on it. Before you know it, you've got 1,000 people within your company that are using this thing. 
and then it goes up to corporate procurement, goes to the IT department, and the IT department signs a $100,000 a month contract, okay? So this is guerrilla adoption, and people in our office, we're a small company, 40 people, they will find tools they like, they download them to their computer, they download them to their phone, they start using them, they adopt them. Before long, I've got the entire company using a new tool, which is great, you know, they like it, very helpful, wonderful. Social collaboration tools, linked content and communication, and of course, everything has to happen in real time. So the way we, the way we roll in our company is when you have a meeting, you always do it standing up, so we call them stand-ups. You don't sit down for a meeting because then they take too long. You generally have a video conference on the wall so that you can invite the people from Mexico or Romania or wherever. Uh, it happens in real time uh, and uh, you've got all of your presentations linked to it. And they do it, they don't schedule the thing in advance, right? So this is not a web meeting, it just, just, it's just a pop-up, okay? Um, so the, the third major trend here is the millennial workforce. Um, some interesting things about millennials, they tend to be more likely to work on demand or on a flexible schedule, okay? So they tend to resist, and I see this in our workforce, you're probably seeing this in yours, they tend to resist a traditional nine to five um, work week, okay? Uh, so they like more flexibility, they tend to mix in the work and uh, playtime weekends, it all kind of blurs together. Um, so they expect to be able to work from home, generally work late hours, definitely in, in software. They do more freelancing. So 38% of millennials say that they would like to work uh, freelancing. And this is something the Department of Labor is trying to figure out because if you have people that are kind of now starting to work composite jobs, Uber and Lyft are the most prominent examples, but you see more examples like this. Um, many of those people are millennials. Uh, they also believe that they're going to be working flexible hours, prefer to collaborate online at work as opposed to in person or via phone. We tend to have this people doing chatter, Yammer, Slack, uh, even within the office because it's simply more efficient to operate a little bit in kind of mixed mode and not interrupt people or schedule a meeting, okay? Um, and they're likely to use, I think this is low, but it says 45% use personal smartphones for work purposes. I think for us it's 100%. We actually don't have desk phones, okay? 41% um, likely to download applications for work purposes. I think definitely in our office it's 100%. And I think people are doing this. I used to attend um, CIO conferences and people would say, um, you know, what, what are we gonna do, do about uh, to control uh, bring your own device, and I, I think, you know, get over it, you know. People are gonna use their own phone, they're gonna use it for work purposes, and, and you're not gonna stop it, so uh, embrace it. So the third, or the fourth trend is mobility, um, and I think in terms of mobility right now, uh, smartphone penetration in North America um, is, I think it's gone past 70%, and lower demographics, it's perhaps closer to 50%. But this is also a global trend. Um, and if you look at uh, globally in terms of mobile enterprise applications, um, there are about three billion global workers, um, but only about 500 million of those have access to some kind of technology at work. The other two and a half billion workers out of a population of seven billion globally are gonna be using some kind of uh, mobile device, okay? So I was in uh, Haiti a couple years ago. A friend of mine has a, a company that does business in Africa. Um, in developed countries, they already use mobile applications for banking, for payments. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is kind of taking off. Mobile technology is what people are gonna use. It's not going to be a desktop, laptop, laptop for sure. And if you think about this, just over the last, um, 30, 40 years. So 40 years ago, I was using a, a, a typewriter. 30 years ago, I had a desktop. Okay, about 25 years ago. And by the way, 30 years ago, my real-time communication was uh, voicemail. Remember that? We all had voicemail, right? 25 years ago, I got a laptop. Okay, that was pretty cool. Because then I could dial in via modem. I didn't have to bring my email 
or didn't have to you know, stay late and do email or do analysis. I could actually bring it home. Um, and then it took about two decades for desktop laptop technology to really get ingrained in work. And if you look at productivity stats over the last 20 or 30 years, productivity has just taken off, okay? And a lot of that is that we now have very, very powerful computing tools on our desks, okay? So it's really only been in the last 10 years that people have had smartphones, okay? And you think about the, the internet was mid-90s. These are all fully networked mini computers. And, and we really don't use them. And we've only had them for the last 10 years, okay? The adoption curve of cell phones has been very, very rapid, much more rapid than computers. And it's gonna profoundly change, given all these other trends about the way people like to work anyway, it's gonna profoundly change the way we operate. So, um, so anyway, I get excited about this just because it's a very big market. If you take 40 bucks a user per year on applications that people will use on a mobile phone, it's a, it's a very large market as estimated by one of the VCs in Silicon Valley. So, so what does all this mean? So we've got changes in technology, we've got changes in the way people like to work and a lot of other trends. So what does this mean in terms of how you can manage a distributed workforce? Well. Uh, online staffing or managing staffing via uh, mobile technology is really just about connecting people with the work they have to do, capturing information about where they are performing the work. So this is work that has to be performed in the physical world. There are different solutions for outsourcing work to people that are sitting at a desk, but a lot of work actually has to be performed at a location, okay? Um, Generally, it's about collecting information about products. So if we're talking about downstream supply chain, uh, you wanna collect information about how your products are being positioned, promoted in the marketplace. And you wanna collect a little bit of information about the work itself. How far do I, did I have to drive to get there? How long did I spend at that location and so on? And I think a part of this, uh, which is important is you need to, take into account the person on the end of the mobile phone, okay? So uh, I think you need to give the person that is using that, that phone the ability to manage their own schedule, manage their own work hours, and give them a bit of power in the equation so that all the data isn't just flowing back to the, um, to the company. So originally, our, our company does a lot of work in CPG retail, uh, pharma, and tech. Um, we did a, a partnership with Deloitte a uh, few months ago that we announced, and they pointed out they have 17 sectors. These are their, the 17 sectors that uh, Deloitte covers, and they pointed out that using mobile technology to manage large distributed workforces actually has applications across all 17, okay? So we're starting to think about, hmm, how does this work? How can you use mobile technology and crowdsourcing to improve data collection in oil and gas, transportation, hospitality, uh, biotech, et cetera. Um, and basically how it works, it's, it's pretty simple, okay? And uh, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface. So you create a project or a gig, you do this you know, using an a internet-based web application uh, you specify where you want the work to be completed, you specify what you want to do, what your target, uh, observation target might be. You launch that, people execute the work, you either pay them, if they're not your employees, we pay them out via PayPal, or if they're your employees, you're ju just directing and then validating that they've completed a set of tasks. And then you get um, you know, information that you can feed back into your own systems about execution in, in the real world. So I want to give you a couple examples of this um, and how it's used in industries, CPG and retail, um, and a, a couple things that we've done. So in one case, we had a, a trade marketing uh, company, so a large snack manufacturer in North America. Uh, they wanted to understand execution of Super Bowl themes. Now, um, the Super Bowl theme displays. Now, um, so my background is actually in manufacturing. So I worked at, um, I worked at Selectron 
started my career at Bain and & Company and, and spent a decade in manufacturing. But, um, and one of the things that's always mystified me about CPG and retail is that um, you execute a promotion and then sort of some kind of magic happens in the store and then you measure lift on the other side. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, in this case, they were only executing at 75% and somehow that was sort of okay. Um, and they, they took this information and then they, they, they said, well, okay, well, that's great. We're gonna take that information, we're gonna fix it next year. And I think we have an opportunity to work with a couple of our, our vendors uh, so that we can execute better, but you know, we'll do it next year. Now, um, so in this case, they, they went and they actually started doing recurring audits so that they could get better data. But I think a better example, another uh, company that we worked with was Pfizer. So Pfizer uh, did a launch of Nexium. They actually coordinated their, their sales teams, their marketing teams, and the team that collected a lot of this data so that when they saw execution issues, they immediately got the sales team on the phone and they fixed stuff, okay? And so one of the, one of the key takeaways I would suggest for all of you is if you have different ways of collecting data, make sure you change how you execute. Otherwise, the different ways to collect the data don't really help you. Um, another company is a company called Crossmark. They're a familiar company. If, uh, if you know merchandising, they have about 30,000 uh, reps. Reps are able to uh, launch their, um, they, well, they launch about 30,000 tasks an hour out to the reps. They get assigned based on location, qualifications, and schedule. And then the people go off, they, do, they execute the task in the store, and then information flows back in real time to, uh, uh, to Crossmark and to their customer. Uh, this is a fun one. So um, Red Bull, um, which is um, preferred drink of millennials, so we have a lot of this in our refrigerator, um, is, it has something called BOGFO, which is back office, goes front office. A couple times a year, they send their back office employees out into the field to actually do merchandising. And uh, when they do that, they wanna collect information about what the employees were seeing in the field. And we're seeing this from some large uh, CPG manufacturers that uh, they do, they have a lot of employees just distributed around the country and they wanna be able to capture information from those employees. And so uh, they can use mobile applications to do that. Um, and then the final one is um, a customer in India. So. They were distributing, um, I guess, medical supplies and samples in the area uh, kind of between um, New Delhi and Jaipur um, and Agra and um, the Nepal border, so basically pretty remote. They were doing it on scooters. They had Samsung phones, uh, and they wanted to confirm that they were getting out to healthcare providers, pharmacies, and doctors in a fairly remote area and actually make sure that they were getting out there and ask a few questions about this. And so they were able to use, again, mobile technologies to capture information and then feed it back uh, to their end customer. So um, maybe just in, in wrapping up, um, you know, two things I would suggest is work is, pretty, is, is going to change pretty profoundly in the 21st century. Um, it's, it's, a com it's completely a result of how we consume products. So because we go onto Amazon, because we can order things and have the, them delivered in 24 hours, it's driving changes in our supply chains, it's driving change changes in manufacturing, uh, and it's gonna drive changes in how we work, okay? We are not gonna have normal nine to five jobs in 20 years, I guarantee it. That's, that's going to profoundly change, and it's just because of the way we consume products, okay? And I think uh, you should think about how mobile technology might be a tool to enable your businesses as we change in, in this new work environment. And the second thing is don't just, if you're capturing data in real time, which you can do with some of these applications, think about how you change your execution model, okay? So don't just, capture the information uh, and then have all this great data, but uh, you know, change how you execute as well. Yeah.
tell me about managing a part-time mobile workforce. What skills does that require of you that's different? Oh, for me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I um, mean, you know, a stand-up, you know, nothing on a calendar. Uh, yeah, we, well, I, a little bit about kind of how we operate. So, um, is any, how many of you have heard of like uh, agile sprint planning? I see Glenn in the audience. Yeah, okay. So many of your software, the software companies do this, but you know, we release new software every two weeks. Okay. And in order to do that, you have to move pretty fast. I think the idea is that you get it in the hands of customers mm -hmm. um, and then you get feedback on that uh, pretty, pretty quickly as well. But um, managing the, I, th I think the key thing is, um, I think it was Andrea that mentioned you, you kind of get people focused on projects, right? And try to get people engaged in you know, the broader purpose of what they're doing and make sure that you have captured their interest and it's a fun work environment. You know, we do all sorts of things. We have actually half of our office is being configured to be what we call the library and the other half is gonna be the lounge. You know, and this is kind of a startup thing, but we'll have a pool table and a whole bunch of other stuff in the lounge side. And if you want to work in a quiet environment, you go over in the library. Um, and I think you just do your best to keep people engaged. Yeah. What questions do you have for David? This part-time mobile workforce. Right? Labor looks really different or could be. Any questions? Yes. We can, uh, let's get the mic so just so we can hear you, Glenn. So, you know, we ran worldwide operations now, right? We Kuala Lumpur in Dallas and, or, or out here in the uh, Austin. How is this kind of impacted, you know, you, you're working, you know, both shifts now. You have to catch it in the evening and catch it in the morning. Do you see this improving the way people work in a global environment in that way? Yeah, so Glenn and I used to work together at uh, E2Open, which is a supply chain company here. So, and we had uh, operations uh, in, in Malaysia and so on. I think, um, I don't know, I think you're pretty much 24-7. Uh, I think it's just kind of accepted. I, there was a, a friend of mine uh, worked for um, Mark Andreessen, who invented the, the mosaic uh, Firefox browser. And um, I remember him in the late 90s saying, he was really surprised he sent an email on a Saturday morning and had the, after, had the response to that email that had cycled through the entire exec team by dinner time um, on, on Saturday night. And um, I think that's pretty much the standard that's expected now. Um, I think you are pretty much always on. And I think the trick is you know, figuring out how to integrate that with life. And it's not, I don't know, the balance thing is, uh, is difficult, right? Yeah. 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 But it's not, I don't know, it's, I, it's, okay. it's gonna be, it's gonna be a challenge for the next, uh, for this, the millennials, right? Because they're, this is kind of the way they, this is the way they work. So the average age in our office is probably about 27. I they're just used to it. I saw a millennial article the other day that says they're having dress up Fridays now. <laughs> <laughs> Casual the rest of the work, dress up Fridays. Well, yeah, so I, I got a text this afternoon. It's, um, I mean, it's hot here. It's, it was uh, 85 degrees in San Francisco. And so I got a text and they said, um, hey Dave, it's pretty hot in the office. Um, shorts and sandals okay? I, should, I mean, sure. Yeah, you know, of course, wanna, yeah. yeah. Whatever works. Any other yeah. questions for David? Yes. Uh. So um, I agree that, you know, we're moving towards uh, on demand. Everybody wants immediate response. Um, as a side note, I'm always challenged to get what I want um, within, so, I live in Ireland, and when I come to the US, there's always stuff that I want to buy online and get before I leave, and I can never get it. So this whole concept of getting stuff delivered, you know, in an hour or getting stuff delivered overnight, it's, it's actually not as real or as practical as people say it. 
But my point is that um, I work a lot in Africa and work a lot in Europe. And I'm constantly, I work at an American pace, so I'm just constantly going. But I am always being pulled up on it. And while Africa actually has a very dynamic consumer, um, uh, like people there are online, they have technology before it's even released in the country because they go to the US or Europe and they buy it. But yet they still are slower um, than what you see in the US. So I'm wondering whether, you know, the focus that you're talking about, the perspective that you're giving is an American perspective. And if you go to the other geographies, I don't think you will find that people expect you to be 24 seven. And if they are, it's typically in support of a US organization and the US business. So call centers in India are there to support the consumer um, requirements or the business requirements in the US. So I, so I think it's, it's also worth looking at um, whether or not uh, the 24 seven or the on demand that we think is there, whether that is just more US centric or whether that is the reality of uh, the rest of the world. So what yeah. do you think? Is it? Well, uh, so we have investors in, uh, in the Netherlands. And so we work, uh, you know, I work closely with them uh, and customers in Europe and Japan. Um, I think uh, we're going to have to figure out how to work in a in a way which is more flexible, but not entirely consuming. Okay, so uh, we will need to learn to turn off. I right now there's uh, we're, this, all this stuff is relatively new, right? I mean, these are you know in the last ten or fifteen years that we've had this capability, and it's really only been in the last twenty five years that we've had the ability to take a portable computer home right, and connect via modem or internet or something. And I think so, we, we haven't quite figured out how to turn off or how to regulate the off hours, okay. So, um, you know, a couple of things we've done at work is you schedule work from home days, okay, and then you are very explicit about when you're offline, okay. So, it, like, if I'm unavailable, I will say, you know, actually, I'll put it in the calendar. Okay. This is... Well, but, but let's, let's, let's challenge that, because I think that we've got two dimensions. One's culture, and the second is generational. And so do you find generational, is, if you think about your European experience, do you find the millennials to be the same in Europe? Is North um, America? I'm trying to think. I, yeah, I would say, actually, I would say it is partly generational. Okay, so I know some very aggressive Spanish and French uh, and for sure Irish entrepreneurs, okay, in Belfast and, uh, and Dublin, right? I mean, Dublin's happening, right? So um, I think it might be, it might be generational and, and partly culture. Uh, and uh, by the way, generational, I also mean age, okay? So I think um, some of the millennials just, don't have a lot of other things that are competing for their time, right? You know, kids in high school and uh, parents they have to take care of. And, and I think that may change their behavior a little bit as they mature. So great feedback, lots to think about. You know, part-time workers, millennials, mobility, reorganization of workforces. Will you be staying for our stand up down in the orchid garden with the wine? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so we'll yeah. continue down there. Um, yeah. And thank you for coming. Good. And we're gonna close up here and uh, we're gonna see people down there in the cocktail hour. But when we talk to people about supply chain talent, which this is a survey we did, one of the interesting things is the top problem is won't embrace new ways of working, right? And so, you know, as we think about new ways of working, right, that's really at the nexus of what you're talking about, right? It's the millennials, it's the mobility, it's about how we work, it's how we organize. And I think that's really an important message for us. So thank you for joining us. Thank very you good. very much. Thank you very much.